I'm Staff Sergeant Drew Schumann with the 127th Public Affairs Office. For several months now, you have enjoyed content on demand and live television streaming right from your desktop. This channel is the next installment in a long list of innovations by your PA office. Your comments and critiques are greatly appreciated. Thank you and enjoy. Hi, welcome to June RSD. I'm General Slocum, and this is what I know today. Today we have the opportunity to come with you from our great Mission Support Group Headquarters Office. Here is where the, one of the most difficult jobs on this base happens. Our Mission Support Group has one of the most diverse, most challenging missions in the Air National Guard, taking care of this wonderful base that we call Selfridge. There's a lot of things that go on here, and there's a lot of wonderful people that are part of this support group. But I do want to take a minute just to start off today. Uh, we have a lot of people doing great things. But today I'd specifically like just to make a call out to Sergeant Miller, who works here in the CSS as part of our mission support group. She's done a lot of great work. We get a lot of great accolades from the things that she does. But especially with our Team Selfridge, when we have our Team Selfridge partners there, she keeps everybody motivated, on track, and organized. She's also been very involved with the MICP, the Statement of Assurance, and making sure that we're held accountable in the right way for the resources that we're entrusted with from the government. But one of the greatest things is, is her positive attitude. You'll always notice that she's got a smile on her face, she's always positive, and it's a wonderful thing, and that is simply contagious. So for the great performance, I'd like just to give you a coin and say thank you so much for being part of this wing. It's airmen like you that make this place what it is. Thank you very much. And speaking of taking care of our folks and recognizing great performance, we had a wonderful opportunity for the civilian awards for our Title V civilians that make everything happen here on Selfridge, the glue that holds this place together. Uh, we had an opportunity to recognize some of our high performers, but just to get everybody together and talk about the wonderful work that our Title V employees have done. Uh, it was a great ceremony. Congratulations again to all of our winners for a job well done. And thank you for the wingmanship of being part of the citizen airmen that make the 127th wing so awesome. Springtime and summertime here in Michigan give us a lot of wonderful opportunities to enjoy what Michigan has to offer. There's a lot of outdoor activities, a lot of things going on in town, and we're certainly going to have a busy summer. Please just be smart with what you're doing out there. Make good personal risk decisions. Remember simple rules like dumb, dangerous, different, don't. Or if you're gonna still do it, make sure that you talk to somebody about it, that you have a great plan, that you make smart decisions and involve others and use that wingman concept. We're not gonna be successful here unless we get every single guardsman home safely every night. So please be vigilant, take care of yourself and take care of your family and the others around you. Speaking of that, also when it comes to those behaviors when we like to have you know, a beverage when we're out doing some of these activities, also be smart. I have a personal rule of none for the road. I'm just asking that you please be smart because we don't want to have any tragedies. We don't want to have bad things happen. Be smart with alcoholic beverages and your personal behaviors. There's a lot of things going on this summer. And you know, we have the air show coming up in August. Well, as part of that, we're going to be doing a mayor exercise or a major accident response where we're gonna set up a scenario where we're gonna work with our first responders, where we're gonna work with our community partners, with our command and control, so that if something does happen, that we're prepared, that we're rehearsed. So we're gonna be going through that here in the near future, and you're probably gonna see some of that going on around, as well as maybe even participating in it to some degree. We wanna give it that sense of realism. We wanna make sure that we're practicing things the way, in case we need to do it in the real world, that we're ready, we're practiced, and it's not the first time we've ever seen it. So just be cognizant. There's gonna be some things going on that are probably gonna be a little bit different, but we'll make sure that we're telling everyone about it. But I appreciate your sense of urgency and your participation in making that happen so that we can be ready. Remember, there's not gonna be a drill in July. So after this drill, it's gonna be our August drill, which is then going to lead into our open house and air show later in August. But I'm gonna take a minute right now, as part of that air show and open house, we have Chief who's with us at one of our STEM events for high school students down at Detroit City Airport. Chief, we're gonna throw it over to you, give us an update, what's going on with all the wonderful air show events, the STEM stuff, and down there at Detroit City Airport. How's it going, Chief? Thank you, General Slocum and team. Welcome to June's RSD. I got a long list of things to talk to you about, but I wanna start with where we are today. We're at D2 
Detroit City Airport. We're at the event, the third event for Inspiring the Next Generation. We've got some exciting lineups happening here today, but most importantly, we've got a lot of students from the local area that are learning about the great things that are happening in aviation and with the great jobs that we have with Selfridge Air National Guard Base. So, tell you what, we'll jump right into some of the other things. We've got camaraderie, that's a great thing that's happening out here. The spirit is high, but we want to make sure that it's happening at Selfridge Air National Guard Base. For the next few months, the weather's going to be great. So I implore you as leaders and as team members to get out enjoy each other's company and find out what's happening on Selfridge Air National Guard Base. And in particular, I want to talk to you about this. This is called 8010. And if you want to know what that's about, ask some of the folks in ARG. They will tell you. It's part of the great things that are happening at Selfridge Air National Guard Base that are part of our national defense strategy. And we're doing it right here at home. So I'm very proud of that and you should be very, very proud of your fellow airmen. Next, our recruiting and retention efforts. We have an opportunity to make sure that we get to 100%, and our boss is doing everything that he possibly can to make the resources available and to keep the energy high and to tell the story of Selfridge Air National Guard Base. You need to tell the story too, and on the other side of that, you need to tell our airmen why it's great to stay in. So if you love what you're doing, if you love where you are, tell the folks about it, tell the team that's in uniform about it, and let's make this team stronger than ever. Now, the last thing. Again, here at the Detroit City Airport, our 100 year anniversary, what we're doing here is we're not only talking about the next generation, we're talking about the heritage of a great organization. Our first 100 years are about great in in innovation, about great sustainment, and about great people that have made it happen. Please, when you get an opportunity, come out and be a part of whatever's happening between now and our 100 year celebration between August 18th and August 20th. Let your family know, let your friends know, let the community know. Get out and about, tell the folks what's going on, be a part of this great event that's happening. I know you're hearing about it a lot, but this is an extremely important opportunity for us to tell our story, not only to the folks in the surrounding community, but for the world to see as a whole. Congratulations on the first 100 years, and I'll see you around campus. Now back to you, General Slocum. Thanks, Chief. I appreciate it a lot. While we're talking about the rest of the summer, I do want a footstop. We do have that open house and air show. Uh, on the 18th itself, Friday the 18th, we're going to have a heck of a good time out here. It's going to be the air show practice, but we're going to have a family day, a picnic, a dinner, a concert. It's going to be a wonderful time for our team, Selfridge Partners and all, and all of our invited guests to come in as part of the open house air show before we open our doors on Saturday morning to the public, where we're going to have that big event for the next two days. Also coming up, though, this summer, we're working on the F-35 site survey. As you know, Five bases, they're going to choose two. We are the last of the site surveys, which is going to happen the week of the 10th of July. There's going to be a team out here that's going to be looking at our base and validating and verifying the information that we've provided about why this is the best place for the Air Force and for the Air National Guard to bed F-35s in the future. So I just appreciate for that week, make sure that we have things cleaned up. There's going to be people walking around, asking questions, touring. They're on our side. These are teammates that are helping the Air Force decide that the F-35 at Selfridge is the right choice and the right decision. I appreciate your support. It's going to be a wonderful summer. Things are only speeding up. I'm General Slocum, and this is what I know today. Hey there everyone, I'm Airman First Class Corey Cutler with your look around the Air Force. For the past week, airmen from 11 separate partner nations participated in the largest European air exercise of the year. Now in its third iteration, Exercise Arctic Challenge is gathering more than 100 aircraft and 1,000 service members during a two-week period in the skies above Sweden, Finland, and Norway. Exercise scenarios are based on a mandate from the United Nations to project a multinational stabilization force should it be needed. The goal of the exercise is increasing interoperability between the air forces of NATO and partner countries. The F-35A Lightning II reached another milestone with its 3000 sortie carried out with a new version of the Autonomic Logistics Information System, or ALICE. ALICE is the F-35A's information technology infrastructure. The sortie departed Hill Air Force Base, Utah, generated by maintainers from the Active Duty 388th Fighter Wing and Air Force Reserve's 419th Fighter Wing. The 388th Maintenance Group Commander, Colonel Michael Miles, says the culmination of the newest ALICE and sortie number 3000 is important because it highlights how fast the program is moving forward and how sorties are being generated at a very high rate with only 22 aircraft assigned to the base. 
Colonel Miles said airmen at Hill Air Force Base are out producing the entire F-35 Enterprise, and the Hill stand-up of F-35 operations is ahead of schedule. This summer, children at Air Force installations have the opportunity to bowl for free thanks to the Kids Bowl Free program. The worldwide program offers coupons to children ages 15 years and younger for two free games of bowling per day for the duration of the program. Members can use the coupon on any electronic device or print it for presentation to the center. To sign up, visit the Kids Bowl Free website. More than 11,000 kids have already signed up for Kids Bowl Free at the Air Force's 70 plus bowling centers. For more on these and other stories, check out AF.mil. And that's your look around the Air Force. On Monday, May 22nd, Sulphur Jair National Guard Base hosted the Ladies Professional Golf Association for the first ever Velour Cup Golf Tournament meant to raise awareness for traumatic brain injuries in veterans. Prior to the event, golfers were treated to a tour of the Selfridge flight line and taken aboard a KC-135 Stratotanker to obtain a glimpse at the 127th Air Refueling Mission. Sponsored by the Eisenhower Center, the first annual tournament marks the start of a relationship which plans to move a traumatic brain injury treatment program to Selfridge, as well as future community engagements to bring awareness to the issues. I'm here because we have the Valor Cup here. It's the first ever where they're going to have a professional LPGA players with female veterans playing uh, a pro-am. Uh, and we love having it here at Selfridge Air Force Base. It's their 100th anniversary, so we thought let's start this off the right way and do something right for the female veterans. We're doing it as um, not just an empowerment event for the female veterans, but also for um, to gain more awareness to female veteran issues and bring female veteran issues to the forefront of the media. The female veteran population is a very underserved population. So there aren't very many uh, female veteran specific programs. There's a lot of male specific programs and a lot of times female veterans don't identify as veterans. Um, whether it be due to stigma or, um, you know, just not feeling identity to being a veteran. We do traumatic brain injury. Uh, our famous brain injury is the after the impact, and it's where we put NFL football players together with uh, veterans that have come back from the war that have traumatic brain injury, they have behavioral health issues, and we're just there to, we heard a call, so we're answering that call with quality recovery and quality rehab. What we're hoping to do is say Eisenhower was here and we're, we're going to be providing many more resources for female veterans and treatment programs. With near perfect weather, 16 LPGA members joined 60 female veterans from the greater Detroit area and across military services. Starting at about 12.30 p.m. and running into the late afternoon, each pro had the opportunity to play, give pointers, and bond with their teammates. For several of the LPGA members, it was not the first time giving back to the military. Uh, my dad flew P3s in the Navy, and my cousin's a Marine, and actually my husband's uh, an Air Force pilot. He flies a C-17. So I definitely have a, you know, a, a military background. My foundation's for the military. Uh, I just think that these are the real heroes in our, in our world, and if I can take the time out anywhere I go to just say thank you or bring awareness to, to our men and women that are keeping us safe, then I definitely will do that. It's, it's been nice. I've been able to travel all over the world and go to a bunch of bases, meet a lot of families, a lot of kids, um, and it's great to, to be able to bring it through the game of golf as well. Um, you know, sport is always a big thing in everybody's lives, and uh, being able to have a voice in what I do is nice. Monday's event was the next in a growing list of engagements with the community, all celebrating 100 years as Michigan's hometown air base. For the Michigan Air National Guard, I am Staff Sergeant Drew Schumann. Dr. Love here with your risk forecast. This summer, high pressure can roll in and push aside common sense and good safety practices. Don't let peer pressure push you beyond your own comfort or skill level in any activity. Don't hesitate to step back and say no. Don't let high peer pressure push you into making a bad decision. Give me your best shot. Give me your best shot.
Hi, my name is Tech Sergeant Jeff Koss. I'm a production recruiter here at the 127th at Selfridge Air National Guard Base. My job as a production recruiter is pretty much I am a career counselor for anyone that's interested in joining the Air National Guard. Here at Selfridge, my job is to pretty much take someone's ASVAB scores as well as their background and align them with the job that they feel that is best for them as well as the wants and needs of that of the United States Air Force and the Air National Guard. Part of my job as a recruiter is I go to almost all the schools with, along with the other five recruiters we have here in the office. We have half the state of Michigan to include the Upper Peninsula. Um, I go and I do in-class visits, mentorship, career advising to all the local high schools from ninth grade up to senior year. And it gives a little benefit for the young men and women to feel if the Air National Guard is a good fit for them. Uh, if it's a good fit for them, then we start the MEPS process and go from there. Um, we have over 40 jobs specifically here at Selfridge with 140 in the United States Air Force as a whole. Uh, typically we like to help young men and women figure out the best career field that benefits them as well as gives them some skill sets on the outside to benefit everyone including the Air National Guard. The biggest thing that I get as a production recruiter is actually when I go inside our units here at Selfridge and I see the young men and women that I put in those specific career fields and the great job that they're doing and making sure that we put warheads on foreheads and continuing the fight against uh, the war on terror. If there's one certainty in warfare, it's that it is uncertain. The way we wage war is constantly changing. We no longer fight large-scale battles like the World Wars. Today's battlefields are arguably the most complex in history. Unconventional warfare against enemies that don't play by the rules. It's the job of Air Education and Training Command to prepare airmen for today's conflicts. To fight unconventional battles, you need unconventional warriors, and that's where Air Force Special Tactics Airmen step in. These airmen are the Air Force's special operations elements that operate on the ground. The journey to become one of these elite warriors is not an easy one. The pipeline is two years with well over two-thirds of each class washing out. A little excessive? The instructors have a reason for why it's so tough. Huh? Hey, hey, sorry, sorry, Try it again, senior airman. Run through the intersection, last man. For us, having combat experience and, and, and working through real world applications downrange, we're able to really institute to the airmen of why they're doing what they're doing and, and how it applies to the battlefield. Let the teams discredit what you guys are doing with them being an Air Force guy. Every guy before you is put out of their teams. You know, they might see certain events yeah. and runs and rucks and things and just think of it as an individual event or training iteration, but you know, it actually applies to certain things that they might encounter downrange in Afghanistan or Iraq or you know, wherever we're fighting our wars. Why? Why did Master Sergeant Helm, a seasoned special operator, decide to be an instructor? I was coming towards the end of my career and uh, I, mean, I, I thought it would be a good good opportunity for me to you know retire and ultimately train my replacement so I, I chose to come here at the end of my uh, towards the end of my enlistment to you know, ultimately train the train the individuals that were going to take over for me. Training the next generation that's what motivates Master Sergeant Helm but it also motivates the military training instructors who take recruits right off the bus and turn them into airmen. Hurry up! Hurry up! Let's go! But who trains the trainer? Who makes airmen ready to don the campaign hat of the MTI? To find that answer, look no further than BMT itself. There is a cadre of MTIs at the Military Training Instructor School who train NCOs and senior NCOs to be MTIs. We receive them, we starting off with orientation like any other PME class, but we're going to pre pretty much bring them through the fundamentals. The fundamentals of how to teach is really kind of where we focus on what are the learning styles and how do each individual learns, and then we start incorporating the teaching format. Before an airman can be transformed into a strong MTI, they need to examine their weaknesses. And that's a huge area they'll focus on while at the schoolhouse. It's okay to tell people you're not so good here, but the trick is together you and that individual need to build that weakness and empower them that anything can be overcome. It's just a slight challenge and within that challenge you become better. For some, like Master Sergeant Carter, becoming an MTI wasn't in her Air Force plans or even something she wanted to do. But after a while, the job grew on her. 
The more I learned, the more I grew, the more I loved it. The trainees, the colleagues, my peers, a sense of admiration for them because those were the ones I looked up to the most and, and I just can't explain how amazing this job really is now for me. Growing, airmen grow through their careers and the Air Force grows along with them. Combat system officers have seen their career field grow over the past few years. The career field is made up of three different jobs, electronic warfare officers, navigators, and weapon systems officers. And like many other career fields, it's full of airmen willing to teach the next generation. It was always in the back of my mind to come back uh, as an instructor in ATC. And I gotta tell you, it's, this program here is much different uh, in, in, for the better uh, than the program that uh, when we had the separate tracks. Yourself up with the easy math for the gauge method. Whether it's telling the pilot where to go, operating the defensive systems, or even dropping munitions, CISOs play a very important role on their aircraft. If the mission was easy, it would be a single, air, a single crew aircraft. They're put on there to manage the systems because the mission is so dynamic. It's, in, it's extremely important for them to understand that and what role they play uh, as a member of the team getting the job done. Whether it's learning to survive, receiving a hat, or even getting wings. Instructors in AETC are committed to making sure airmen are ready for today's fight. It kind of brings you back. Uh, we all went through training at one point, and then when you're done with training, you go on to uh, what we call the real Air Force and fly combat missions. Um, but to come back here and teach brand new students, not only the importance of being professional and, and flying the mission and getting the mission done, but Bringing that experience that you had, excuse me as an example, bring the experience that I had in the RJ, uh, a couple deployments under my belt by the time I got here. Um, telling them those war stories and how important their job is and how they tie into the mission, you get the, you see the excitement in the students' faces. Uh, so that's the best part of the job, absolutely. Snipers from all across the globe gather for the National Guard Marksmanship Training Center's 46 Wisdom P. Wilson and 26 Armed Forces Skilled Armed Team Sniper Man. Championship. Drop the mag, drop the mag. Clear it. And the National Guard especially do the uh, training, you know, one week in a month and two weeks a year. The, uh, the time frame for these National Guard soldiers to be able to train and get the, the gun time that they need to hone their skills and be proficient in marksmanship is not as, as much as you'd think they would be. So a competition like this gives them the ability to come, get a lot of gun time, uh, work on their skill craft and stalking, land nav, and uh, high elevation shooting, and that stuff that back at their home station they may not be able to accomplish. For the second year in a row, the Army National Guard Michigan team took home the trophy. Bottom one. And the National Guard especially do the uh, training, you know, one week in a month and two weeks a year. The, uh, the time frame for these National Guard soldiers to be able to train and get the, the gun time that they need to hone their skills and be proficient in marksmanship is not as, as much as you think they would be. So a competition like this gives them the ability to come, get a lot of gun time, uh, work on their skill craft, stalking, land nav, and uh, high elevation shooting, and that stuff that back at their home station they may not be able to accomplish. You know, we have four different countries that are here that, this year, and you know, they, they feel like it's good enough that they come over here as well. Stay proficient in your sniper task. Uh, even though you go to the sniper school doesn't mean that you're 
a fully qualified, skilled sniper. Yeah, you have the identifier, but you, uh, you're you always continuing to learn. Go, go, go. I think we're doing all right. It's our first time shooting a uh, actual, I guess, sniper competition. So kind of learning how to how to game the game and what what needs to be done. But I think we're doing all right for for first time around. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, very interesting. Talk to the guys that have done it before and uh, just learn how they've done things and what they're running. I think it's good. Uh, it's a different environment than I'm used to, and uh, it's good to come out and uh, meet the other guys. Go. The main thing is it just wants to be better than when we came. We always want to win. We're all alpha personalities here, all competitive. But the main thing, if we can take anything we learned here back, we could all become better because of us being here. You're always continuing to learn and improve on those skills throughout your career. And this is a good opportunity to come to and hone those skills and try to see what you're proficient at and what you need to work on. Hey there everyone, I'm Airman First Class Jasmine Vander Hayden with your look around the Air Force. The Air Force presented its fiscal year 2018 President's Budget on Tuesday. The Air Force requested a top-line budget of $132.4 billion in Air Force-controlled funding. The budget supports a total force end strength of just over 500,000 personnel, increasing the active force by 4,100 and the Guard and Reserves by 1,700. Included in the total force budget is a 2.1% pay raise for active duty airmen and a 1.9% pay raise for civilian personnel. You can find more on the Air Force's 2018 fiscal year budget request on AF.mil. Last week, the Pentagon hosted the Department of Defense Lab Day. The event featured more than 80 exhibits that focused on innovation and was an opportunity for people to see what's happening with new technology. These people in this building are working problems every single day for the warfighters across the globe. And they may bring a, prob a problem in that these, the scientists haven't really thought of that this, the technology they're using and developing could address. During the event, DOD Service Scientist of the Year as well as STEM Advocates of the Year were recognized for their contributions. The ability to determine atmospheric change is critical in order to execute missions. The mobile weather platforms used today have been around since the 60s and rely on helium, which is a scarce, expensive resource. The Air Force Research Laboratory is working towards a solution to the mobile weather challenge and has turned to the public for ideas. The proposals that meet minimum requirements will be graded against each other and the best ideas could win up to $15,000. If you're interested, you can learn more and submit your ideas on www.challenge.gov. For more on these and other stories, check out af.mil. 
And that's your look around the Air Force. My name is Staff Sergeant Aaron Hammer, and I'm here to tell you about the night that completely changed my life. On Thanksgiving, I decided to leave a friend's house to go to the corner store after I had been drinking. I was going well above the speed limit when I lost control of my car, struck a fire hydrant, and continued to roll my car four times through a wall before finally stopping once I hit a tree. I wasn't seriously injured, but the first thing I thought when I got out of the car was why didn't I just die? That told me that maybe I had more than just a problem with my drinking. I was arrested for driving under the influence. I spent 44 days in an inpatient treatment facility that taught me how to deal with my drinking issues. There are consequences for poor decision making. You choose how to handle difficult times and you're not invincible. Hello, Mr. and Mrs. America, and all the ships at sea. Dateline, Southbridge Field, Michigan. America has entered World War I, and a new air base is created near Mount Clemens. The nation needs its sons and daughters to answer the call to service on a new frontier in the wild blue yonder. Now, Team Selfridge presents an event so big it has been 100 years in the making. See aerial planes and displays from every age at the 2017 Selfridge Open House and Air Show. Walk through the history of 100 years of Selfridge as we highlight some of America's most treasured historic military aircraft. Take a tour through the decades as we celebrate a century of service right here in Metro Detroit You'll see historic warbirds and today's military aircraft based at Selfridge and serving our nation today, including the A-10 Thunderbolt II, lovingly known as the Warthog. The flying gas station known as the KC-135 Stratotanker. The Army's twin rotor workhorse, the CH-47 Chinook Helicopter. See how the Coast Guard saves lives on the Great Lakes with the HH-65 Dolphin Helicopter. Learn about how the Department of Homeland Security protects America's borders with the Great Lakes Air and Marine Wing. Bring the kids, bring the neighbors, as you see ground displays, flying demonstrations, and more at Michigan's largest military air show and open house. Headlining the 2017 Centennial Air Show, will be the world's premier fighter jet demonstration team, the U.S. Air Force Thunderbirds. August 19 through 20, 2017, Selfridge Air National Guard Base. Free admission and free parking. You don't want to miss it.
The EOD motto is initial success or total failure because there is no second chance. The Kosovo Security Forces, they grew up with these munitions in their backyard and that different lifestyle of you could possibly run into a landmine or run into a submunition in your backyard or people trying to build a fence and worrying about hand grenades. That's a completely different lifestyle than what we're used to. After you're in the suit for a while, your thought process starts to diminish. That's why we work in teams is you have somebody there to say, so what are you going to do next? And you might say something completely out of left field because you're not thinking clearly at that point in there. And that's why you're constantly communicating with your team member to make sure that everything that you do is safe and that you're still thinking clearly. I'm scared of plenty of things. Birds and bees. <laughs> I'm terrified of birds. My guys laugh at me so much. Um, it's probably the most irrational fear to have here. I mean, honestly, I'm just, you know, I'm, I always worry about my guys. I just want to make sure that we all come home safely, and that's my goal at the end of this mission. You know, my mom was an extremely strong role model. Um, you know, just her story um, of resilience uh, growing up in a, um, you know, in a segregated society in the early 1900s. I have sisters uh, that were uh, from the Women's Army Corps. So three of my sisters were WACs, as they were affectionately referred to, and uh, one sister that was a WAF, who was in the Air Force. I remember starting out, my parents had to actually sign for me to attend West Point because I was not yet 18. Uh, didn't know the challenges that would be ahead. Never thought that I would be here to, today. Because I remember as, you know, 18, 19 year old cadets seeing female officers that were attending the, you know, um, you know airborne schools and being in, the, in the, the units were kind of role models, things for us to look up to. You know, women going from a, a core that was separate, with separate training, and very limited MO, uh, military occupational specialties that they could join, all the way up to our first uh, female four star. Um, a lot of advances and, and changes have occurred. A study after study has shown that, uh, you know, diverse teams are more um, intelligent teams. A diverse group provides different perspectives and would give you a wider range of solutions, but we really do have probably one of the the greatest teams of professionals on the face of the earth and what they do um, for our nation. My background, I was actually born here in Fort Bragg on July 2nd, 1992 when, on WOMAC, which is now the Social Support Center. Uh, the elementary school up the street, I attended there. High school, I attended college here. I joined the military and ever since then it's been on a huge incline upward. I never expected any of this to happen, so it is just a blessing. Both my parents served and I wanted to, they loved it, I always speak highly to it of it to this day, and so I just wanted to be a part of what they thought was the best time of their life. Uh, my mother, Teresa Bluebird, uh, she was, is from South Dakota, grew up uh, around uh, Sioux Falls. Her our heritage is Lakota Sioux. Um, she's more Native American than I am. I'm more of like, since I was adopted into a Puerto Rican family, I know more Puerto Rican side, but I still take pride in being Native American. Uh, it's, with the Army, how that fits in, it brings so much pride to um, the reservation because of the fact that my mother was the first Native American female to complete 20 years in the Army, and now I'm the daughter of that, and I'm doing great things in her footsteps as well. So the, I know the reservation is super proud, as well as my mother. She just becomes in awe. She just, uh, she's in disbelief that I'm the first female paratrooper of the year. She's in disbelief that I uh, just made sergeant. Uh, she's still in disbelief that I'm following her footsteps. What it means to me to be a part of the ASIC Airborne Division is an uh, honor, a blessing, and a very humbled experience. I love being paratrooper of the year. I love being a soldier. I love being a medic. My mother and my father are both jet masters, and for me to continue in their footsteps is a complete honor. So I, lo I love it. Sitting up there on the fuselage, that little friend can do more than a male can do. Rosie. Rosie's got a boyfriend, Charlie. Charlie, he's a Marine. Rosie is protecting Charlie, working overtime on the riveting sheet. <laughs> they were advertising for women, so we thought, oh, that'd be fun. Oh, the, we can be involved in helping the war. Of course, the men at first resented hearing that women were going to work, 
after we finally proved ourselves, and they, they taught us some jobs and everything, and, and we proved to them that we were able to keep it up, keep the schedules up, and get the job done right, they start respecting us, and we all cooperated together, and it was just great. And if we got tired, someday we'd say, let's all go to work today. Oh, okay. But most of the time, if we felt that way, we'd play a record, a little phonograph, wind it up, put a 78 record on, and play, play that Rosie song. So that gave us <laughs> an incentive, we better go to work. <laughs> and uh, some of the guys would say, you're working too hard, you make us look bad. I said, well, go to work then. You know, work. <laughs> I'm so grateful that anybody even cares <laughs> just because I work. There's a lot of roses left, but they never worked till they were 95. They weren't that crazy. <laughs> what do you miss the most? People. All my life I worked around people. And I want people, and here there's no people. But everything that happens with me, no matter negative or otherwise, it's all an adventure. That's what life is. You gotta consider that so you won't feel sorry for yourself. They can't understand why at my age I still have energy, but I've always had it. I'm just used to having it. And so sometimes I can't sit still. So I have to get up, move around, and think of doing something, take long walks. I take walks around here. So age is becoming, I don't know, people are working, uh, staying healthy longer, and they get bored and they want to get out and do something. You don't want to just sit around and do nothing. You can fall apart that way. So you got to keep moving. In a quiet Arizona desert, Betty Blake is growing old. Her memory is fading. What is today? What day of the week? Thursday. Her vision is blurry. Thank goodness the VA gave me one of these enlarging machines. Yet despite aging, her spirit is still young at heart. If I just had good eyes, I'd be really going strong. It's women with a spirit like Betty who paved the way for female equality in the Air Force. I feel very, very blessed to have been there at the beginning and gotten in. It's been an exciting life from a little kid that grew up on the beach in Honolulu. Regardless of her age, Betty will never forget the time she spent working as one of the first female pilots in U.S. military history. I may just didn't think women could fly military planes. We had to show them. There were so many experiences and I, when I sit and I'm alone a lot and I see something, I turn TV on and then they have a, something about a plane or something on there and it brings back memories. And, I've got lots of good memories to think about. I'd love to do all of this again. It was a highlight of my life. Staff Sergeant Sean Hostetler, Paradise Valley, Arizona. Sir, in looking at risk, is there ever a time when you assess the risk and just say, we're not going to do it? The answer is absolutely yes. And you can imagine that one of the reasons that they pay us to go out and do developmental tests is so that we can strike that important balance between risk and reward. If they wanted us to evaluate whether a decal could stay on the side of the aircraft at Mach 2, chances are we probably would not be flying our aircraft. Now, it's a different story if it's a weapon. Then we need to make sure that that weapon is secure and functions as advertised. Hey there, everyone. I'm Staff Sergeant Tracy Keller here with your look around the Air Force. Air Force leaders have removed the restriction keeping pilots weighing less than 136 pounds from flying the F-35A Lightning II. The restriction was due to concerns about the risk during ejections. After rigorous testing on the F-35 ejection seat, three distinct modifications have been made. 
The seat now has a switch that slightly delays parachute deployment at high speeds and decreases parachute opening forces for lightweight pilots. They've also mounted a head support panel on the rear risers of the parachute to prevent the pilot's head from moving backwards during an ejection. The new ejection seats are being retrofitted into the existing fleet and the lightweight helmets are available in pre-production now with full production starting later this year. Mental health disorders are more widely recognized today mainly because of better education about things like depression, anxiety and adjustment disorders. But with early treatment, most can be effectively addressed. Many airmen worry that seeking mental health care can negatively impact their careers. But airmen who avoid treatment may actually be jeopardizing their health and their career by staying silent. Mental health is just as important as physical health and Air Force mental health providers are trained in the latest critical practice guidelines developed by the Defense Department and the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. For more info, contact your local mental health clinic. And for more on these and other stories, head over to AF.mil. Also, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube page to check out more videos like yesterday's Air Force, Air Force Tech Report, and Blue. And that's your look around the Air Force. We've been fighting with the British and the French for, for 100 years now. In just about every conflict we've been in, they've been by our sides in the air. In fact, if you go back to the beginning of American combat aviation, the French taught us how to fly. The relationships, they run deep and they've run deep for many years between our nations and particularly between these units. In fact, a number of the engineers already knew their counterparts here in the USAF by the time they came off the aircraft. So uh, what that means is there's a level of trust right from the very start of the exercise. The Atlantic Trident is actually the second in a series of trilateral exercises between the United States, the UK and France where we bring together the frontline fighters of those countries. We play the adversaries. So actually on a normal basis here, uh, outside of the exercise, we are the adversaries for the F-22s. And specifically in Atlantic Trident, we are the kind of the lead group for the adversaries. So it's us and the F-15 Strike Eagles from Mountain Home playing the Red Air. Shifter 6-1, stand by. Back but what is important to this and what we hope to gain out of this is the ability to operate on night one of a war that is at the high end, not the type of war we're fighting now, which is at the low end of the spectrum, which is in generally uncontested airspace. What I expect out of our young pilots in the F-22 is more than just operating their machine or a group of, of F-22s. They're actually now acting like an airborne quarterback for the fight. They have so much information, uh, sensor information available to them that they're able to direct the fight from a fighter cockpit. It would look to use our missiles and our aircraft to, uh, to try and engage as many targets and then those that perhaps we can't deal with, it, looks to, it would come in and, uh, uh, and clean up the picture. We tend to focus on the machines. We tend to focus on the fact that the F-22 is a superior airplane or the F-35 is a superior airplane or the Typhoon performs better in this particular environment. But I think it's important to note that any one of these airplanes, no matter how capable it is, can be defeated by another airplane if the pilot operating it isn't prepared. We're here, we're learning each other's tactics, we're learning how to, uh, what we call fighter integration, so we're learning how to fight together. Uh, it's a pretty, pretty awesome thing and, and as the exercise goes on we get better. You can never stand still because the world around you keeps evolving and I think it'd be arrogant to assume that my nation, uh, France or the US had all the answers and I think that we all need to learn from each other. We need to pick best practice wherever we can.
Located along the shores of Lake St. Clair in southeastern Michigan, Selfridge Air National Guard Base is home to the 127th Wing and more than 40 tenant organizations. Less than 10 miles from the city of Detroit, Selfridge Air National Guard Base is the largest Air National Guard installation in the United States. For 100 years, Selfridge has stood at the forefront of our nation's defense. Today, as new and different threats continue to emerge from around the globe, the airmen of Selfridge stand ready to transition to America's next generation of fighter aircraft. Selfridge has the existing infrastructure, base amenities, close range access, and culture of professionalism that is necessary to accommodate the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter or any of the nation's fifth generation of fighter aircraft. Along with the 127th Wing, Selfridge is home to the U.S. Coast Guard's Air Station Detroit, the U.S. Customs and Border Protection's Operational Integration Center, and units from the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps. Selfridge Air National Guard Base has provided highly trained personnel to every American conflict since World War I, from launching alert fighters on September 11th to contributing to today's missions. Selfridge Airmen stand ready to serve state and nation. Today, the 127th Wing flies both the A-10 Thunderbolt II and the KC-135 Stratotanker. With these aircraft, the Wing has contributed thousands of hours of flight time to missions both in the U.S. and overseas. The National Guard Association of the United States awarded Selfridge Air National Guard Base the Carl A. Spatz Trophy for being the top flying unit of the year in the Air National Guard. Highlights contributing to this year's Spatch Trophy include an outstanding safety record, excellent inspection rating, exercise and deployment performance, and community involvement. The 127th Wing at Selfridge operated as the most deployed wing with the highest operational tempo in the Air National Guard. A significant advantage to the fighter mission at Selfridge is its proximity to the Alpena Combat Readiness Training Center and the Grayling Air Gunnery Range, both being just over a 30-minute flight from the base and can be in a tactical airspace in as little as 15 minutes. Airspace over both northern Michigan and parts of Lake Huron are dedicated to military use and provide the largest training airspace east of the Mississippi. Northern Michigan features three geographically separated electronic threat emitters and is able to accommodate the training needs of any unit. Featuring a 9,000-foot runway, ample ramp space, and 100 years of history with fighter aircraft, Selfridge is ideally equipped to deal with the nation's most advanced aircraft and weapon systems. With 10 enclosed maintenance bays, two engine hush houses, and 12 aircraft shelters, Selfridge has the current ability to house 24 fighter aircraft. Space also exists for the addition of 24 aircraft shelters without any modification to the current fighter ramp, with additional 127th wing assets supporting local tanker operations. Space exists around the airfield for additional maintenance facilities if needed. In total, Selfridge could easily house up to 48 F-35 Lightning II fighter aircraft. Both the Fighter Squadron Ops Building, home to the Red Devils 107th Fighter Squadron, and the munitions facility at Selfridge are less than five years old. Part of a series of construction projects that has brought a state-of-the-art fire rescue station, medical facility, dining facility, and other modern assets to the base. Selfridge is one of few Air Guard bases which features the many amenities of an active duty facility, including a full-size fitness center, child development center, full-size base exchange, and Michigan's only military commissary. Community involvement at Selfridge is highlighted by the Base Community Council. Business leaders and supporters from the local area make up the 250-member BCC, which meets monthly to discuss issues as they pertain to the base and surrounding community. Selfridge Air National Guard Base has an unparalleled relationship with its neighbors. From infrastructure needs to the support of the Motor City community, and now entering its centennial year, Selfridge Air National Guard Base is ideally suited to serve our state and nation for another 100 years. From the expertise and dedication of our Michigan Airmen to the ready availability of our facilities, Selfridge would make an ideal location for the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter as well as any of America's next generation military aircraft.